strategic objectives will be three main ones, and actually the only ones we'll have, and then every other thing will fall under these three key areas. Uh, that is enhance access to quality education, training opportunities for girls and women in Africa. So education beyond uh, just the classroom, but further giving skills through training. Now, there goes my enemy of progress. Who is that, Martin? <laughs> okay. They have to refresh it? Okay. Yeah, this tells me the French classes I've been going to, I have to practice. I only have now the French version. <laughs> Okay, let's go on. So the next uh, strategic objective is to enhance generation of utilization, generation, sorry, and utilization of research evidence to inform education policy and practice. We pride in being the knowledge lead in Africa for anything girls' education. You want to know anything about girls' education? Ring far away first. We have the answers and we want to have the answers for the next five years. Because everything we say must be evidence-based and must be supported by what is happening in our communities. We will have a research hub. We want to also have a center of excellence where you get this information at the tip of our fingers and we are able to explain what that means. So every time we'll keep justifying why we are still working for the girls, we'll show you data and research on why it's still important to work for the girls in Africa for the next five years. And then strategic objective three will be to strengthen institutional capacity. We need to build ourselves. We need to improve. We are not yet there as far away. So we need to continue improving our management systems, our programming systems, our governance, whatever. We need to grow. We are part of an organization that is a learning organization and adaptive, an organization that adapts. So we'll enhance uh, our capacity so that we have better operational um, systems and also to have an effective FAWE network. Uh, when I talk about FAWE network, it includes all our chapters. So what I'm sharing here is also what the chapters will adopt and we'll be working together. The only difference is that it will be customized to the national um, uh, perspective or the national situations. Our approach will be strategic partnership. That's why you're all here. We must work with partners. There is no success without partnering, collaborating, uh, working with others, efforts, especially like now, there's no proposal succeeding if it's not in a consortium. We all know that, right? So we have to even talk to our friends and those who even you think you are, are your competitors, you have to sit in the same room and think what our comparative advantage. So partnerships will still have to be our approach. Evidence-based advocacy, I've talked about it, so that still remains uh, a key issue. We shall not talk about anything that affects the girl in Africa that we don't have evidence for or we have not done research for. And we have now to work at community in level. We are already at the communities, but expand even further. And I'll soon explain in our new areas that we are going. Community engagement is where we need to make even more changes and uh, give more impact. Private sector engagement, you've seen us working a lot today with the DTB Bank, they were here with us yesterday and Monday and other private sector because they care, they have the social, uh, the corporate social responsibility. The question we'll be asking ourselves is where are they investing in? Because they need to invest in education if their businesses are to make sense. The other day I was uh, joking with um, the HR, Lillian Gala, who was here, and I said, you need to invest in education if you want more women bankers. If you want more women bankers in the next 10 years, you need to invest in education. Otherwise, we will not open bank accounts, we'll keep our money in our mattresses, or if we open, we shall not do much with you. We'll not even understand what you mean by profit making, saving, and all that. So my queen is looking at me because uh, the Bank of Eswatini has had. <laughs> Done deal, eh? <laughs> so key pillars, advocacy and policy influence, that's our food. That's what we do. 
that is what we were established for, to advocate and speak for policies and uh, uh, yes, policies and legislations that influence uh, positively our education systems. And then knowledge generation and dissemination, I've spoken about that. Capacity strengthening for us, our chapters, our partners who we work with, our alumni, that we build our capacity. Nobody, I like there's one thing that our finance director says, I can't say it correctly, but I'll try. He says the 21st century is for people who are willing to unlearn, learn, and relearn. So we are there <laughs> to build our capacity and continue going on. Then collaboration and networking, I spoke about partnerships. So our programs, again, my pictures are not so, oh, don't worry. <laughs> These are kids who are so excited. I think they're watching something on a laptop. And I, I just keep imagining the joy, whatever it was, I wish I knew where this photo was taken. They, they're really happy. and. I look at this and I think we need to make more smiling faces, more girls and boys who can look at a computer, smile because they know how to use it, they can work with it, it can work for them and it can change their lives. STEM will remain our, our area of work. That's the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Centers of excellence, turning ordinary schools to centers of excellence. Uh, I say this uh, on Monday, but allow me to repeat. Uh, my boss, when she was explaining to me centers of excellence when I joined Farway, she said, ordinary school is the one that just has the Ministry of Education regulations and follows all those regulations. That's the way they've been told. Number of teachers, books, curriculum. But a center of excellence goes beyond. It has gender responsive teachers, gender responsive material, teaching practices is different, the facilities in school are different, the infrastructure has changed, parents teachers association speaks differently, they are gender sensitive, and the surrounding community. So when we are talking about centers of excellence, that's what FAWE does, and we'll continue doing that in the next five years. Then education in emergencies, we've done it in a few of our chapters, in the next five years, we want to see all our chapters working with girls in emergency. Because we have so many of those girls who are left out because we fear maybe areas of conflict, we are not sure. I'll never forget one of our development partners who made us uh, explain almost like three times in a proposal why we are going to South Sudan and why we also want to work in Somalia. The national uh, who are here can, can confirm that. And we, the good thing is that the development partner got convinced. But they were, they were like, are you sure you'll get results? We said, even in conflict, education must go on. It doesn't matter. Even in conflict, education must go on. And we'll find out how those people can still be educated, even as whatever conflicts are being resolved. And so for that, we are in Somalia, in South Sudan. We are in Chad anywhere that conflict is far we want to be there to make sure the girls are not left behind. And then climate change, yeah, thanks. <laughs> then climate change still will, uh, will be our area. Um, few chapters have been working in this sector. We hope to have all our 34 chapters doing something around climate change because the truth is a lot is changing. I was just giving an example of um, just last week, where we had quite a big flood in the coastal region of Kenya. And I kept telling myself, if the schools were open, we would be talking about a national disaster. So then we need to know, what do we do? What are the adaptive uh, practices for climate uh, destructions? And what can we do? And what can the children do to participate to stop some of these calamities? Because people think it's all about, it's called COP21. <laughs> somewhere in some international world, but we need to engage the, the girls or the children in school. Uh, Tuseme, we've heard about Tuseme, not today, the TED talk, not um, um, our first alumni who spoke about what Tuseme has done in their lives. And we've also had uh, uh, our talk about mother's clubs at the Gambia. So we have them in some of our chapters, but now it's expanding to other chapters. Um, where am I? Yes, GRP. Uh, yesterday we launched our digitalized uh, system for GRP. 
the whole idea is that everyone should be able to access it from wherever you are. And when somebody asked, is it for free? I smiled because it's for free. Fawe gives for free. We don't charge. We give for free to make the change that we want. And I'm really hoping that you'll get excited uh, from January to be really live and going. Try it on yourself. It's not only for teachers, yeah? Try it on yourself, do the test, and see if you're by yourself gender responsive. And this takes me to, I'll come back to Tibet, gender responsive pedagogy for early childhood education. Let me try something in the room. If you are going for a baby shower, Madam Dorothy, I don't know why, because you're looking at me. Tell me those colors you carry when it's a girl who's been born. Ah, you see, they've even said it for you, pink. Where did you get that pink from? Huh? You don't know, you just found yourself with a pink. I, I usually show up at a girl's uh, bright baby shower with something blue. And my friends look at me like, is it an insult? I'm like, it's a color. And then I use this example on Monday where I said, my daughter tells me she's two, two and a half. Um, ask me that story, she's a COVID baby. <laughs> Martha will tell you that I was one of the teenage pregnant ladies <laughs> who suffered COVID-19. So she's two and a half. And she tells me, mama, color pink is for girls, color blue is for boys. Two and a half, and I'm a gender activist. Who taught her? Who is that teacher? So I was telling um, the group I was sharing with that, I feel like going to ask that teacher, but I'm like, it's my role as far away to find a means of going to that school in a friendly way and see if I can get the teachers <laughs> to be taken through GRP training, other than going to ask her, who told you to tell my daughter that pink is? Anyway, so we'll start now GRP at early, child, um, early childhood education. Not that we've not been there. We have been there, we even have a GRP for ECE, but the idea is now expand take it further, make it grow, and, and see what else it can give us so that we don't have children as early as two and a half years old already being told how pink is not their color. And then GRP for Tivet, work in progress, but I believe by January we'll be having our GRP for Tivet. This is just to make sure that in our Tivets we are not making, um, insisting on our girls just taking the traditional, uh, what are they called, subjects. For example, traditional subjects. Uh -huh. Some, my chair said here dressing, but why are you guys leaving my chair to answer? Is it that my English, my accent, my what? Anyway. <laughs> oh, someone else said tailoring. What else? We do it, we do it. And you know the women in this room and men in this room who have very good nannies. And after a time you think they have raised your children and now you want to release them and you feel the award you can give her is to take her for what? Imagine, and you all said it nicely. Like, a, yeah, that's the best gift you can give your nanny. To go for what? Tailoring. Oh, but engineer Makumbe said cooking. Hey, she's even worse. Cooking classes. <laughs> oh, Stella will take her for hairdressing. Uh, you'll take for her? You Dressing. Okay. Now, after today, we are all going to say, after today, the Fawe Third Triennial Conference, I shall not take my nanny who has served me well to do dressing, but to do what? Huh? Ah, now you people. Someone said doctor. She can't be a doctor. She will. Let's be, let's be serious. Huh? Uh -huh. Auto mechanic. Uh -huh. Now you see, when you come from Ghana, you say auto mechanic. When you come from Kenya, you just say mechanic. <laughs> ah, plumbing. Someone said plumbing. And the other one, the last one? <laughs> Coding. Ha! Hmm. I like Aisha, but I like Honorable Aisha, but she said she'll take her for coding. That's what yours is doing. Wow. You see? Let's give her a hand of applause. Yeah, so it can be coding, it can be anything. So 
At least I know. I've had a few voices here. So from now on, in the next five years, we will have nannies who are being awarded with plumbing, coding, auto mechanic, carpentry. Yeah, okay. But basically, that's what we are saying as far away. Let's give them skills that has money. Because that's where guys are going, yeah? Where they have money. The plumber to change your tap in your house and the money you put on the salon are not the same. You know, that guy comes once in your house and he makes money for a week. The hairdresser makes 10 heads, eh? Heads, head, hair, heads. Now, the problem is if I, if I give more examples, I keep uh, speaking broken English. Makes heads or hair? Heads, okay. Then we'll have GRP in higher education, right? And this is at university level, we also need them. And we have had these successes in Rwanda, Ethiopia, Uganda. It's now just a matter of expanding to other chapters and the universities. So how will we do this? I'm just about to end now. If you were in the meeting on Monday, there's a figure I said here, please do not be surprised. I want a few of you <laughs> that that was a typo I had before. And we are looking at 400 million. We already have one of our partners who's taken us half there in terms of the comprehensive scholarships of these TVETs I was talking about. We are almost there. If any of you had the speech by Rita Roy of MasterCard Foundation. So we need more people to just come and take us to the other half. So while they take care of these young people going to TVET universities so that they earn skills to be employable, we need other partners to come in for Tuseme, for what? Career guiding and counseling, for climate change to reach our children in emergency areas. So we have still a far place to go. And then resource mobilization will continue being our area of work because we need the money to be stable. We need to implement this strategic plan with all our chapters so that it's one document that all of us read from and pull our ideas from. And then lastly, our governance and management. Remember what I was talking about, capacity building and changing, um, like changing how we do our operations so that we have more effective programs. Ah, the last slide. For sustainability, you know, every time an NGO person, most of them, not all, and I know not the ones who are in this room, when people are asked, so what are you going to do about sustainability? The first thing we think of is money, right? We think sustainability is all about funds. No. Sustainability is also how far you reach out to more people who can take up your idea, and even if you're not there, they can expand it. So whether we are there or not, like sometimes I go to places and like chapters, and they tell me, oh, you know, this program, we got it from the regional secretariat. Are you not implementing it? And I'm like, that's sustainability. Because now somebody else has picked it and doing the same thing over and beyond where we started. So we will want to have a bigger outreach. The other thing is advocacy and policy changes. If we get a policy to change anything that we are doing now for girls' education, that's sustainability in itself there. Because we believe if you have good policies, then for the longest, okay, I know there are, we also still argue that there are policies that are just in a shelf. But we will work hard that they move from a shelf to, <laughs> to somewhere. But for those who have moved it from a, sh a shelf, then that's where our work will be for more sustainability. Research and collaboration, I'll not overemphasize that, in terms of capacity building for research. And then we also have capacity building initiatives. I already talked about that. Uh, because the truth is, if FAWE today trains Teresa, and I already started telling you about my training on centers of excellence, no matter where I go, that is information that will never go. And I'll speak about it, and it's increases the sustainability as long as I'm able to pass it on to the next generation and other people who I meet. So build, building our capacity and other people so that we sustain our ideas. Even when there's no money, the idea is sustained 
and it can still be implemented when resources are available. Then streamline our organizational processes. I already talked about that. And then promote a sustainable a sustainable resource mobilization. I know I said this is where we all start, but for far we believe money will come when all these other things are stable and working. And lastly, monitoring and evaluation, uh, evaluation <laughs> effectiveness. Uh, if you don't look back to check what you have done and then want to look in front of uh, where you are going, then the difference will not be noticed. And we, we will be brave enough to monitor our work. We will be brave enough to take feedback of where we are not getting it right. And then we will be brave enough to make the changes. You remember the story of unlearn, learn, and relearn. We will be that far away. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me.